Hi everyone and uh, very good evening and welcome to session 3 of uh, the series that we have started of the tricky tables that are there in Robins which I'm sure all of you have been facing an issue with. So we are just out here discussing these tables and trying to make them a little simple so that we can recall them and all those tough genes and chromosomes and numbers uh, especially the session which we had yesterday on proto-oncogenes many of you wrote to me thereafter that that was one of the toughest tables of Robins and uh, you know hopefully we have accomplished it and we have learnt it now. So similarly, on the same pattern, we've got uh, three, four more tables today. The first table that I'm going to begin with is uh, one of the easiest. It doesn't really need mnemonics, but it's a table which I've got for your revision and that is tumor markers, right? So everyone agrees that tumor markers are something that you have to learn and it's, um, you know, one question somewhere or the other, if not path or surgery is going to get stuck in this table. After that, we are going to move on to a table of uh, pheochromocytoma. So uh, how pheochromocytoma or a paraganglioma can be associated with certain syndromes. So that is something which has a Robin's 10th edition update also, the syndromes of pheo and paraganglioma. Third, we are going to go on to uh, GI polyps. I hope everyone, it's a table that we did on the Unacademy platform also uh, somewhere in the beginning of this month. But one question from this table always comes and I want to quickly rapidly revise this with you guys. In the end, I just have to tell you in four or five lines, certain genes that can be associated with chronic pancreatitis. That's another table that you have in Robbins. Chronic pancreatitis or in pancreatitis in general, uh, this uh, is definitely it's an inflammatory lesion, but yes, it can be hereditary also. So what are the genes that would be involved in this? So these are the tables that we are aiming at today. And before I begin with the session, let me tell you about tomorrow. So tomorrow at six o'clock. So we've done three days of back to back uh, tables and it can get a little toxic at times. So tomorrow let's go in for a quiz. Let's go in for a live quiz at 6 p.m. on the same YouTube channel. And in this quiz, uh, it will be a mixed bag, especially for the INI CET students and the NEET PG students. You need to watch out for this quiz. It will have some 20 odd questions which are going to be from any possible chapter of pathology. So 6 p.m. tomorrow, a break from tables and questions which I've taught you in these three days would also be there in this quiz that we are conducting, right? Okay, so uh, all okay with the audio, video and the screen, guys? Should we proceed with the tables without any delay? A quick thumbs up about the audio, video, no technical issues and let's start. Okay, yes. So all's good. Let's begin. Number one table is not for me to teach you. It's actually a revision table that I've got for all of you to teach me. And that is the selected tumor markers that you have to know, right? So uh, I'll keep enumerating tumor markers one by one. This is what is the list given in Robbins. I'm going to add two or three more to it, which are important. And then uh, the next table onwards, I have something to teach you. So why don't you teach me sometime uh, something about this table? Let's begin with tumor markers first and foremost tumor markers are something that you detect where remember it is as simple as a blood test but that is not where the story ends if you see robins clearly if you see the last column and i'll show you not only can you see it in the blood but you can also measure it in the stool samples you can also measure it in the sputum samples you can also measure it in the urine sample so remember blood sputum, stool, urine, all of these places you can test for tumor markers. Tumor marker testing can be done. So let us go one by one and let's talk about it. So first categories of hormones, I think everyone can answer for me. Guys, beta HCG, the very, very famous while you tell me the tumor with which beta HCG would be elevated, let me tell you, we always measure the beta subunit of HCG. We are not interested in the alpha subunit because the alpha subunit is non-specific. The alpha subunit of a lot of hormones is the same like LH, FSH, TSH, 
HCG, all these have the same alpha subunit. So you know the alpha subunit is not of diagnostic importance for you. Beta subunit is important for you. Very good. So many of you answering choriocarcinoma, but I didn't want the story to end there. Other than choriocarcinoma, also there's one more tumor which can show you increased beta HCG levels. Any germ cell tumor, non-seminomatous germ cell tumors. Okay, so I'll display the list. Beta HCG, choriocarcinoma, like all of you told me, and remember, non-seminomatous germ cell tumors can also show you beta HCG elevation. Very important. Okay, talking about calcitonin. Calcitonin, I think everyone knows, medullary carcinoma thyroid. Um, who will tell me medullary uh, carcinoma thyroid can be associated with a particular proto-oncogene mutation which we studied yesterday. Med, men and the name of that gene. Medullary carcinoma thyroid is associated with a proto-oncogene mutation which we studied yesterday. Quick answer on that. Yes, quick answer on that. RET, if you remember, we did a mnemonic called excellent. We did a mnemonic called MED MEN RET. So MED was for medullary carcinoma. MEN is the MEN syndrome. And RET is the gene, the proto-oncogene that was mutated resulting in this. Today, I'm teaching you the tumor marker that is calcitonin. Okay, so Dr. Sahil has put up a question that ma'am, can beta HCG sometimes be elevated in a seminoma also? And you've put up, Dr. Sahil has put up a percentage of 50. Let me tell you the latest literature says that not 15, even up to 30%, even up to 30% of seminomas can sometimes show me beta HCG elevation. Beta HCG elevation, that is the latest literature that it says. 30% seminomas can also, but definitely for seminoma, beta HCG is not my tumor marker. I have other tumor markers, right? Like we have PLAP, we have LDH, those are more reliable in comparison to beta HCG. Calcitonin done. I think catecholamines, everyone knows pheochromocytoma. And you know, today we are going to do the table of pheochromocytoma also. So everything will sum up then. Catecholamines is the tumor marker. 5-HIAA. 5-HIAA. So HIAA is a metabolic product of, it is a metabolite or it is a metabolic product. 5-hydroxyindole acetic acid. 5-hydroxyindole acetic acid is a metabolic product of? Yes, that's an open question for everyone. Quick answer on that. Because if you know it is a metabolic product or what, you know the tumor that I'm talking about. Excellent. Serotonin. It is a metabolic product of serotonin. 5-HT. So serotonin serotonin metabolic product hydroxyindole acetic acid whenever i think of serotonin it comes from a tumor that is carcinoid tumor right carcinoid tumor so please hormones clear with everyone i think this was basic stuff that you already knew let's go on to little advanced information second set of category of proteins are oncofetal proteins first focus on the name guys oncofetal fetal means it was uh, expressed during when we were in the fetal stage that time the fetus produces these proteins adults don't adults don't the fetus produces them but when do adults start producing these proteins when they have onco when they have cancers so onco fetal proteins that it's a cancer which is showing you fetal like proteins and you've got two under these one is alpha fetoprotein one is an alpha fetoprotein. I think if you go back to the fetal life, from where does alpha fetoprotein come? It comes from the yolk sac. So which tumor will release alpha fetoprotein? Yolk sac tumor, right? Other than that, alpha fetoprotein comes from two hepatic tumors. One of the adults, one in the adults that is hepatocellular carcinoma and one in the child that is hepatoblastoma. Now, talking about hepatic tumors, uh, tomorrow um, I'm going to ask you some questions about the recent advances of hepatic tumors in the quiz that we have. So if you get time, read about the recent advances. It will help you crack the questions tomorrow. Okay, so leaking out some topics, at least you can be prepared. Okay, so alpha fetoprotein is a tumor marker of yolk sac tumor, HCC and hepatoblastoma. CEA, what is CEA? Carcinoembryonic antigen C. All of them have something to do with fetus or 
embryo in their name so alpha feto protein carcino embryonic antigen that is why these are oncofetal proteins so cea it comes from all these tumors one of the most favorite questions most students just learn colon cancer and go but not the case see remember the way you pronounce cea c so the mnemonic is c Kapil Sharma. Do you remember we did the same mnemonic Kapil yesterday for something else also? KPL. We did the mnemonic KPL for some mutation yesterday. For some mutation yesterday. And there also I told you colon, pancreas, lung, colon, pancreas, lung. Which mutation? I'll give you options. KRAS, HRAS, NRAS. Come on guys. Quick answer. Which mutation was showing you colon, pancreatic and lung cancer? KRAS, HRAS, NRAS. Okay. Got the answer from all of you. Amazing. KRAS. So KRAS was showing you these couple tumors. KRAS mutation was showing you couple tumors. Same tumors now show you the same tumor marker. So remember CEA, CEA, C. So that will remind you of CEA. KPL will remind you of colon, pancreas and lung. And Sharma will remind you of stomach and heart. So these are the five tumors that Robbins has mentioned. CEA is a tumor marker of colon, pancreas, lung, stomach and heart of which you know the same colon, pancreas and lung show you the same mutation that is Keras mutation. Are we clear with the oncofetal proteins? So C, Kapil Sharma is your mnemonic. Moving on, coming to, coming to the lineage specific. That you know if this is there, I know that I'm talking about a lineage of tumors. The easiest ones, PSA and PAP. The words tell you, what is PSA? Prostate specific antigen. Prostate specific antigen. So obviously prostate cancer. What is PAP? Prostatic acid phosphatase or alkaline phosphatase. This is where we ended the session yesterday. Do you remember? Prostate acid phosphatase. Prostate acid phosphatase, right? So these two will obviously be elevated in prostate cancer. Common sense. Ig, immunoglobulins. Immunoglobulins, obviously, plasma cell tumor, they will be increased in plasma cell tumor, that is multiple myeloma. This is also common sense. What is NSE? This is also common sense, guys. N for neuron, neuron specific enolase. So all the neuron words that will come in tumors will have increase in NSE like neuroendocrine tumors, neuroblastoma. So do you realize that in these three days, we've almost read everything about a neuroblastoma. We've read almost everything about a neuroblastoma. First day, we read all the prognostic factors. Yesterday, we read an amplification which happens in neuroblastoma. You tell me which one. CMIC, LMIC or NMIC? Which amplification happens in neuroblastoma? CMIC, LMIC or NMIC? Yes, guys. Simple one. I hope you remember N for N. Neuroblastoma was showing you NMIC amplification. Hai na? And today you've done the tumor marker also. There's an increase in neuron specific enolase in neuroblastoma. Tomorrow in your quiz, the most extra edge topic neuroblastoma, I will be telling you something more about it as a form of a question. Let's see how many of you will be able to crack that question and then I'll teach you, right? So tomorrow actually we will cover everything that you had to know about neuroblastoma and this topic will be done. Okay, so we are done with these. Before I go on to the next category, which is a very important one, NSE, do we read it anywhere else? There is one NSE called neuron specific enolase, neuron, neuron, everything, neuro, neuro with it. What is NSE that is non-specific esterase? This is something we study in hematology. Non-specific esterase. Did all of you attend, uh, say, almost a month back, we had a session on uh, the special stains in hematology. If not, Please do get back and see this. It's on the same channel. Please do see this because all your hematology stains that you have to know from start to end are in that one video and that's very helpful. So many of you saying neuron specific, uh, non-specific esterase, non-specific esterase. Okay, many of you saying ma'am AML, but tell me which type of AML. 
Tell me which type of AML. Do the, does the myeloblast lineage come positive or is the monocytoid lineage which is going to come positive? Excellent. Dr. Harshit and Dr. Himanshu and others. Great. Dr. Sunita. Good. Monocytic lineage. So you've got AML M4, M5 because the monocytic lineage is positive for for non-specific esterase. So just in the exam, if you see NSE, read the full question. Is examiner asking you NSE that is neuron-specific enolase or is he asking you non-specific esterase? Please read it very, very carefully. Okay, moving on, uh, moving on. Have you seen these numerous CA markers which come to you in the paper? 125, 19, 9, 15, 3 and I've added some 27, 29 and 72, 4. So I guess the first one is everyone's favorite. You always know this. CA-125 for ovarian cancers. For ovarian cancers, which category of ovarian cancers? Surface epithelial tumors or germ cell tumors or metastatic tumors or sex cord stromal tumors. Which category of tumors? It is surface epithelial tumors. It is surface epithelial tumors right? CA-125. Who will tell me CA-19-9 and 15-3? First tell me 19-9. First tell me 19-9. It's a very simple mnemonic. You have to flip the 9, you have to flip the 9 and you get a P. So it is pancreatic cancer. Pancreatic cancer. If we have any FMG students in class today, this was your recent August exam question in which CA199 was asked as a tumor marker and you had both in the option pancreatic cancer and colon cancer let me tell you CA19 is a tumor 199 is a tumor marker of both but in such a scenario when you have to select one then remember CA199 for pancreatic cancer same way how else the question actually came to you was they asked you tumor marker for pancreatic cancer one option was CA199 and one option was CEA. Do you remember CEA, Kapil Sharma? Do you remember that was also positive in pancreatic, increased in pancreatic cancers? So now if they ask you, what is the tumor marker for pancreatic cancer? And CEA is also there. And CA199 is also there. Please remember CA199 is what you're going to mark. Okay, so it's a better tumor marker for. And that is what is being practiced and prescribed by the clinicians also day in and day out. Okay, moving on. CA-15-3. CA-15-3. So, you know, out of this 3, I'm going to make a B like this. So, I'm always going to take the last digit. So, in 19-9, I flipped the 9, I got a P. In 15-3, I'm going to take the 3 and I'm going to make a B. So, that is breast cancer. That is breast cancer. Remember both of these. 15-3 and 27-29 are for breast cancer. 15-3 and 27-29 are for breast cancer. Last one, I would uh, expect the INI CET aspirants to learn this and go. CA-72-4 is for gastric cancer. CA-72-4 is for gastric cancer. Are we clear with this? Of all of them, you know, this is the table or this is the part of the tumor marker table which gets you all the questions. The CA markers that are there. But the story is not over. The story is not over. I have to teach you some new ones also. So now, please remember new markers or other markers that you have to know. NMP-22. NMP22 is a marker for recurrent bladder cancer. How will you remember? How will you remember? Two times. Recurrence means happening again, happening again. So tumor happening twice. Tumor happening twice. Okay. And the second alphabet is B. So it's a recurrent bladder cancer. NMP22 is recurrent bladder cancer. Okay. Um, Okay, so you're asking me what is, these are all uh, numbers and different types of the molecules under CA. CA stands for carbohydrate antigen and these are different numbers and types that are associated with it, right? Okay, so NMP22, so 2 will remind you of happening again, recurrent and 2 will remind you of second alphabet, so recurrent bladder cancer. Okay, now what are these three things that I've written? P53 gene, so TP53, RAS and uh, TP53, RAS and it should be APC, I'm sorry for this, and APC, 
okay so now um, do you remember for ras we've already done the mnemonic that is kapil colon pancreatic and lung colon pancreatic and lung so do you see colon pancreatic and lung are the three tumors that i've written so remember p53 ras and apc if i'm seeing in the serum and the stool serum and the stool means blood and the stool you'll think of colon and pancreatic cancer but if you're seeing it in the sputum you will think of lung cancer so that's common obviously in the sputum you'll think of lung cancer and the stool you'll think of colon cancer are we clear with this guys everyone so we finished uh, the tumor marker table which was more of a revision for all of you i suppose and i hope everyone is okay with that a quick nod should we uh, should we go forward uh, someone's asked me the full form of nmp it is nuclear matrix protein um it's not a question that you're going to actually get nuclear matrix protein okay nmp nuclear matrix protein uh dr gopal that's for you okay so uh, moving on now moving on coming to the next one that is this table in front of you in which robins has made an addition so what is the table it's which are the familial syndromes with pheochromocytoma and paragangliomas right so the familial syndromes are what we are targeting whenever i say pheochromocytoma is there any uh, uh, rule that comes to everyone's mind the rule of the rule of so those many percentage are not associated with hypertension those many percentage are malignant those many percentage are extra adrenal so that's the rule of 10 hai na that's the first thing that comes to everyone's mind you know your mnemonic for this table because pheochromocytoma everyone always remembers rule of 10 so i decided that you know i i really sat for a very long time and i thought that i have to find a mnemonic which comes up from 10 and all these things you should be able to learn from the mnemonic 10 so it almost took me approximately half an hour to think how from 10 can we learn this full table i hope that helps you as well okay so first i'll teach you and then i'll tell you how to learn it so what are the uh, if we decode this table these will be the syndromes which will have pheochromocytoma and paragangliomas and something else with them because they are syndromes right okay so please remember if i highlight a few so i hope going by the mnemonic rule of tens we should be able to sort it out right okay so what do you have see first read with me then i'll tell you the mnemonic okay just read with me if there is a ret gene mutation you know men to a men to b i think everyone knows this so men to a men to b have pheochromocytomas and paragangliomas they are associated with ret gene mutation i think everyone knows this then simple if there is a syndrome neurofibromatosis type 1 then the gene is neurofibromatosis 1 the gene that is mutated is nf1 if there is a syndrome con called von hippel lindau syndrome the gene is vhl gene if i ask you their chromosomes who will tell me the chromosome for ret who will tell me the chromosome for ret yes guys the chromosome for ret again it's going to be a kind of a you know a nice rhyme that we are going to make it is chromosome 10 it is chromosome 10 so you know how i make students learn ret then start from here 10 okay men med now you'll never forget the full spectrum ret is the gene it is present on chromosome 10 with 10 obviously rhyming you'll think of men so that is men syndrome and in men syndrome which is the thyroid cancer that occurs that is medullary carcinoma thyroid so ret 10 men med you'll always remember this right and today i've also told you that it has pheochromocytomas and paragangliomas okay nf1 who will tell me the chromosome for nf1 the chromosome for nf1 guys very simple you just have to calculate the number of alphabets in neurofibromatosis how many alphabets in neurofibromatosis 17 so remember nf1 gene is present on chromosome number 17 so count whenever you have so much time in life sit and count the number of alphabets of neurofibromatosis 17 okay now coming to vhl von hippel lindau so with gene 
VHL gene. VHL gene simple guys. Three alphabets. Chromosome three. Three alphabets. Chromosome three. Are these okay with everyone? Because now when I'll tell you the mnemonic of tens, you should be able to correlate the chromosomes also. So when I'll say chromosome ten, you'll say red. When I'll say chromosome three, you'll say VHL. With N or chromosome seventeen, you'll say NF one. Are these syndromes clear? So men. NF and VHL they show you paragangliomas and pheochromocytomas what is this that i have written on the bottom this is the robins 10th edition update this is the robins 10th edition update guys please remember let's decode it so i'm taking it up on a def different slide okay so um you have uh, this is what was written on that bottom part of the table this is what has been added in the robins 10th edition so they've added hereditary paraganglioma 1 3 4 hereditary paraganglioma 1 3 4 now you'll ask me that ma'am 2 5 ye sab nahi hote let me tell you when you read this table i'll take you back to this table this table when it's given in robins below this table they very clearly mentioned that they have only told you the main syndromes with which pheochromocytoma is Associated or paragangliomas are associated, right? They have not told you those minor, minor ones. When you read the text, there are so many. So don't confuse yourself. Limit yourselves to what Robbins has told you. That is anyway more than enough. Okay, so we've got hereditary paragangliomas one, three, four, and you've got a syndrome called polycythemia paragangliomas syndrome. So common sense in the polycythemia paragangliomas syndrome. If I ask you, other than paragangliomas, what is the thing that the patient will have? You'll say polycythemia. Common sense, right? Okay. So please remember. Now let's go to the genes. Please remember hereditary paragangliomas family. This is because of succinate dehydrogenase. So how will you remember in the exam? You will write one, three, four, one, three, four. Then in the opposite way you will write B C D in order alphabetical B C D. So this is because of succinate dehydrogenase D, succinate dehydrogenase C gene, and succinate dehydrogenase B gene defect. Right. So in the exam, whenever you get a question on hereditary paraganglioma, and I do expect it because it's a it's a recent update. So remember one, three, four, and from bottom you'll write B C D. You've got your hereditary paragangliomas, and you know you know what happens. Additionally, I've taught you succinate dehydrogenase somewhere in GIT. In the beginning of the month, we had a session on anacademy, and I taught you something very very important about succinate dehydrogenase, guys. What was it? What was it? Some tumor that happens in the stomach and the intestine. If you all remember, gist. So if I ask you, these hereditary paragangliomas patients, apart from paragangliomas or pheochromocytomas, what is the other thing that they'll have? You'll say, okay, they had succinate dehydrogenase, which means that they are associated with gist. Okay, this is done. What are we left with? Polycythemia paragangliomas syndrome. Polycythemia paragangliomas syndrome. What is the gene that is mutated? E pass one. So you know E pass one has been named. Uh, it's a not altogether long name, which you don't have to know the full form of E pass. But how I have used E pass gene over here. So please remember, you've got P P S. Polycythemia paragangliomas syndrome. So P for Polycythemia, P for polycythemia. Then you can't take another P, so you take the next alphabet. That is paragangliomma syndrome. So remember, polycythemia, paragangliomma syndrome, PAS. So you will always think of E PAS one gene. You will always think of E PAS one gene. Are we clear with these syndromes, guys? Hereditary paragangliomma one three four and polycythemia paragangliomma syndrome. In the exam, if you get a question, they have paraganglioma in their name. Do you think you'll have a problem in correlating that they are going to cause paraganglioma? Obviously not. With which ones will you have a problem? You will have a problem with these men, men two, men two B, NF one, VHL. So that is your mnemonic, the rule of tens. So how have I written the ten? Everyone answers for me. This is not something I have to teach you. So please remember ten. What is present on chromosome number ten? So it's the rule of tens. What is present on chromosome number ten? Yes, it is ret. Remember, on chromosome ten, you have you have ret. 
okay then if you go to the next alphabet e you will be reminded of e pass 1 gene everyone tell me e pass 1 gene is causing which particular syndrome that has paraganglioma quick answer e pass 1 gene e pass 1 gene polycythemia paraganglioma syndrome amazing okay so e for e done the next e i've changed it into a i've changed it into a 3 because all of you know what is on chromosome 3 which gene it is vhl gene vhl gene so vhl syndrome n4 nf1 syndrome n4 nf1 syndrome and s4 everything to do with succinate dehydrogenase so simple what as so this is not a new mnemonic that you've learned you will anyway know that whenever i say pheochromocytoma the first thing that will come to your mind is rule of tens and that is what i've used but i've just written the tens in a different manner with 10 i've reminded myself of ret with e it is e pass with 3 it is vhl with n it is nf1 with s it is succinate dehydrogenase and my entire table is over so uh, sorry this is the table in front of you and all of these you have finished are we clear with these i expect the hereditary paraganglioma part to come in the paper so please revise it a few days before anyway all these pdfs i would recommend that uh, you know two days before your exam uh, open up these videos maybe on a 1.5x speed open your pdfs and quickly go through them because these are such high yielding tables that something or the other will get stuck in the paper so please make use of these pdfs okay moving on this table is also done what else now let's go to something easy I think something that all of you have learned earlier also, and that is the GI polyposis syndrome. So this will be a very good revision for all of you. We'll talk about the syndromes. Okay, we'll talk about the syndromes. Then we'll talk about what genes are mutated, what lesions can happen. Is there any other than GI lesion that can happen? So if I ask you how to categorize, can you tell me? I'm using these terms. I'm going to talk about these syndromes. I know the table is not visible like this. I'll decode every column over here. So tell me, juvenile polyposis, Peutz Jeghers, Cowden, Cronkite Canada. Which family of polyps do these come under? Which family of polyps do these come under, guys? Hyperplastic polyps, inflammatory polyps, hamartomatous polyps, or adenomatous polyps. Which family do they come under? Very well, these are hamartomatous polyps. So all that I'm going to discuss with you next is going to be a lot of hamartomatous polyps, right? So now that full table I'm taking up one by one. Okay, under hamartomatous polyps we have juvenile polyps, or very famously all of you know it as juvenile rectal polyp. All of you know it as juvenile rectal polyp, right? As soon as I use the word juvenile, the age that comes to your mind is less than five years, right? As soon as I use the word rectum, the sight that comes to your mind is that it is a rectal polyp. Now you have to know the genes that are mutated. So remember, less than five will be four, or will be two. So remember, SMAD two and SMAD four gene mutations. SMAD two and SMAD four gene mutations are seen because when you'll think of juvenile, you'll think of less than five years, and when you'll think of less than five years, you'll think of four and two. So you'll think of SMAD two and SMAD four gene mutations. Are we clear with this? Should we go on to the next? But before that, what was the question that came in the NEET PG this year, beginning of this year on January fifth? January fifth, twenty twenty NEET PG exam. The same image was given as as on the basis of the recall that we got from the students. The same image was given, in which they gave you a history of a five year old boy with bleeding PR. so 5 year old juvenile bleeding pr very well indicative you didn't actually have to even look at the photo but this picture was given to you so what do you see out here the ones that i have encircled these are all dilated glands they are cystically dilated glands cystically dilated glands and that is what you see in a juvenile rectal polyp 
Is this okay with everyone? Should we go on to the next one? I think next one is everyone's favorite. Everyone's favorite that is Puth's Jagger's syndrome. Puth's Jagger's syndrome because it's got such nice photos, images that you always uh, tend to study this well. So first and foremost, everything in Puth's Jagger's is to do with 11. Okay, everything is to do with 11. So if I ask you what is the gene, it is STK11 or LKB gene. STK11 or LKB gene loss of function. So please remember STK11 or LKB1 loss of function. That is what is, uh, that is, what is important over here. Moving on, what is the median age? Again 11, it is usually the median age of onset. 11 years okay where do you see the polyps and what does the patient have so p and j remember patient will show you mucosal pigmentation let me show you a picture as you see out here patient will show you mucosal pigmentation so in putes jaggers you will see p for pigmentation and j for j e jaggers j e for jejunum the most common site where this occurs is jejunum most common site is the intestine jejunum so what kind of polyps happen over here what kind of polyps happen over here as I just showed you, what are the words I've written? I've written Christmas tree appearance or arborizing polyp, basically like a tree. So look at this. Everyone will agree with me. This looks like a cauliflower or a tree, basically. That is the classical appearance of a Puth's Jagger's polyp. This is the, the tree-like appearance, the tree-like appearance, okay? So now you'll ask me that, okay, uh, ma'am, I can see the epithelium is making this tree fine. But something must be making the branches also. So what is that thing that is going inside and making the branches and dividing this tree? So what is that branch made up of? Remember, it's the muscle. So from below, from below, the muscle is going to go upward and go in between the glands. Do you want to zoom into this and see it? Look at this. Can you see these round, round glands over here? I'll use a highlighter to uh, show you this. Can you see the round glands out here? All of these round glands? Yes. And then can you appreciate these strands of muscle that are going through and through? These strands of muscle that are going. That is the high power of what I showed you. So this looks like a tree. It looks like a tree. And it's the muscle that is going, strands of muscle that are going inside. So coming back, remember Puth's Jagger syndrome, P for pigmentation, J for jejunum, polyps are Christmas tree type, everything is 11, STK 11 and median age is 11 years. Now, um, let me tell you some complication. Maybe you've read this in pediatrics, median age is 11 years. Can you tell me any complication that can happen because of these polyps? Polyp will be something that will have weight. Maybe it can pull down the intestine. I've given you quite a big hint. Polyp might pull down the intestine, one segment might telescope into the other. So there might be one segment of intestine, one segment of intestine that is going into another segment. What is that? Intussusception? Yes. So please remember Puth's Jagger syndrome or Puth's Jagger polyps can result in fatal intussusceptions. Fatal intussusceptions. Right? Is this okay with everyone? Is this okay with everyone? Now, so again, I want to show you these photos, mucosal pigmentation and arborizing polyps. Okay, moving on. Third, Cowden and benign Ruvelkaba relay syndrome. Sounds tough, but is rather very, very simple. So let me tell you, let me tell you, uh, both of them, when I'm saying Cowden or I'm saying the benign Ruvelkaba relay syndrome, they are associated with P10 gene mutation. P10 gene mutation. Okay, so I saw your answers right now. Great. Everyone had answered into your susception. That is amazing. Okay, uh, Dr. Usha, uh, yes, that uh, was uh, trying to show you the muscle only. That was to show you the muscle. Okay. Okay, so coming back. So cow den and P10 and benign Ruvelkaba relay syndrome. So remember P10 is on chromosome number, chromosome number 10. And with which syndrome is it associated? Cow den. So we've done so many rhyming things. Earlier we did ret ten men med. Hai na? Now we are doing P10 gene, P10 gene, chromosome number 10, cow den. Okay, chromosome 10, cow den. So what will it have polyps? Yes, we are studying it in GIT, so it will have polyps. 
other than polyps what are the cancers that it can have so remember you will learn it again from p10 you will again learn it from p10 so remember for with p10 you will have n for endometrial cancer n for endometrial cancer t for thyroid cancer and the p i will change into a b so that will be breast cancer so what are the tumors that you can have with p10 gene mutation you have n for endometrial t for thyroid and p make it a b and call it breast cancer and apart from that you're studying it over here so polyps are going to happen polyps are going to happen other than that can it show you anything else can it show you any other manifestation who will answer for me can it show you any other manifestation guys any skin tumor that it can show you any skin tumor that it can show you yes who answers that who answers that is uh, someone who's very well prepared and is also someone who's heard the previous lectures very well so that person answers it what is the skin tumor and i've given you quite a big hint what is the skin tumor that you can see excellent tricky lemoma that was again and again encircling the t so t not only th stands for thyroid cancers it stands for tricky lemomas of the skin tricky lemoma of the skin please remember so n for endometrial cancer t for thyroid cancer and tricky lemoma p for b that is breast cancer same cowden syndrome happens because of p10 p10 mutation can also result in benign ruvel kaba rille syndrome but over here all this story is not going to occur only other than polyps you have mental retardation in the patient okay so other than polyps you have mental retardation in the patient are we okay with this last syndrome should we do and finish it off what is the last syndrome cronkite canada syndrome cronkite canada syndrome is no gene mutation non hereditary condition non hereditary condition thankfully no gene you have to learn this will also have polyps like we are reading and it will have everything in dermatology that you study everything so what are the three things that you study in dermatology the most skin hair and nails so person has problems in skin hair and nails right remember skin pigmentation skin pigmentation nail atrophy and hair loss skin pigmentation nail atrophy and hair loss so all dermat things are happening over here now there is something which i want to add a fifth one that is tuberous sclerosis now this was something which was there in the 9th edition also but if you go on to read the text of the 10th edition they have elaborated upon it that hamartomatous polyps can also be seen in tuberous sclerosis so definitely out of all if we have to get a question this time on the hamartomatous polyps tuberous sclerosis is something that you would extremely expect in the paper are we clear with this guys so if i take you back to the table let me take you back to that long table i've made you finish juvenile polyps putz jeggers cowden syndrome cronkite canada syndrome tuberous sclerosis and we are just left with fap i think everyone's heard of fap familial adenomatous polyposis right so i've taught you familial adenomatous polyps a couple of times uh, i can just summarize for you over here can you tell me in familial adenomatous polyposis how many need uh, polyps should a person have we've studied this in so much of detail today we won't go into all of the detail because today we are focusing on the gene the genetics so what is the gene that we have for apc or do you want me to revise do you want me to take 5 minutes and quickly revise fap for all of you should we go in for fap revision in a quick 5 minute i think we can do that so um i couldn't leave it incomplete so i guess i will complete it uh when i say fap we have familial adenomatous polyposis and all of you are right very good minimum 100 polyps minimum 100 polyps right what gene so remember familial adenomatous polyposis is because of adenomatous polyposis coli gene simple to remember familial adenomatous polyposis is because of adenomatous polyposis coli gene adenomatous polyposis coli gene and it is present this gene is present on chromosome 5q so fap tells you everything f for chromosome 5q and ap for the apc gene how many polyps will this patient have this patient will have minimum 100 polyps 
and then you have these three categories classical classical means nothing fancy just minimum 100 polyps if at all the patient can have anything other than this then there's a congenital hypertrophy of the retinal pigment epithelium see classical usually means classical scenario 100 polyps is other that's it but apart from that patient can have congenital hypertrophy of rpe at times then we have two more syndromes which you get questions on turcot syndrome and gardner syndrome turcot 100 polyps gardner 100 polyps but what else Turcot will immediately remind you of a turban. Turcot will remind you of a turban, will remind you of head. When it will remind you of head, you'll think of brain tumors. So, Turcot syndrome will have meduloblastoma, glioblastoma, like you can see written in front of you. Remember, Turcot, turban, so brain tumors. Gardner syndrome. Gardner syndrome has everything if you go layer by layer in your body. Layer by layer in your body. Gardner syndrome has everything. So number one, what do you have? First layer, you have the skin. You have the skin. So what does Gardner syndrome show you? Epidermal cyst. It shows you epidermal cyst. What do you have below the skin? A lot of fibrous tissue. So what does Gardner syndrome show you? Fibroma. Below the fibrous tissue, what do you have? Bone. What does Gardner syndrome show you? Osteoma. So go layer by layer in the skin, you'll get everything. Okay, so first layer, skin, epidermal cyst. Second layer, uh, fibrous tissue, fibromas. Third, bone, osteoma. And with bone, you'll remember teeth also. Bone and teeth. So remember, these patients have supernumerary teeth. I'm going to show you a question also on how it can come. So layer by layer, if you go, you know gardeners. Turcot will remind you of turban. So you know it's brain tumors like medulloblastoma. And classical will just have 100 polyps. So if I ask you one question, everyone, osteomas, adenomatous polyps of the intestine and supernumerary teeth are seen in, I think this is quite a simple one. So you'll think of polyps that, okay, adenomatous polyps. Then you'll think of osteomas and supernumerary teeth. It's a clear cut case of Gardner syndrome. It's a clear cut case of Gardner syndrome. Yes, everyone got that. Everyone got that right. Option A, perfect, amazing. Okay, now what is the thing that I want to highlight in that table? This I've taught you. I want to highlight in that table a new gene that they want to uh, tell you which they basically is not something new that was invented it's basically something that was there in uh, I would say it was there in Robbins in uh, in Harrison and now it has you know come up in Robbins also and that is something known as the Muti gene that is something known as the Muti gene so I'll uh, just show all of you the uh, spelling. So remember what is the extra information that you all have to know. There is something known as M-U-T-Y-H gene. So the polyps that happen because of this is known as muti polyposis. It is known as muti polyposis. So if you read the last line of that table, it is M-U-T-Y-H polyposis, muti polyposis. It was there in Harrison. They've added it in Robbins. And what I want to highlight it, this results in polyps of the stomach and polyps of the intestine. Polyps of the stomach and polyps of the intestine. So remember this, muti polyposis. This is one of those last paragraphs of Harrison that was written. And now this is the last line of the Robbins table also that is written. So you must keep a track of it. This also causes the same adenomatous polyps and you need to know it is muti polyposis. Okay, guys. So um, done with this. Can we now go on to the last table? The last table that we have for today. It's a very short table. You don't have to know it in full detail. I just have to tell you the basics. Pancreatitis. Whenever I think of pancreatitis, inflammation comes to your mind. Inflammation comes to your mind. Inheritance never comes to your mind. With inflammation, genetics hardly comes to your mind. Inheritance hardly comes to your mind. And that is what makes this table very, very important. Inherited predisposition to pancreatitis. So you've got a couple of genes that are written over here. There are three the first three which I'm going to decode, which are the most important and in your INI CET you expect this and the others are up to you. If you're good at learning, you learn it. Otherwise, you can leave it. I won't force you on that. But the first three. So let us go for it. When I say pancreatitis, you are going to take 
the first and the last alphabet because these two genes are the main ones. PRSS1 gene and SPINK1 gene. PRSS1 gene and SPINK1 gene, at least when you think of pancreatitis, these two should come to your mind. Minimum, minimum these two. So you'll ask me that ma'am, no. First tell me the most common gene which can be associated with inherited pancreatitis. It's the first alphabet. PRSS1. You know what is PRSS1? It's a trypsinogen gene. It's a trypsinogen gene. Forget everything written over here for a minute and tell me. In pancreatitis, forget inherited, otherwise just think of pancreatitis, what was happening. In pancreatitis, do you agree that in the end, all the enzymes are activated? Quick yes or no. In the end, all the enzymes are activated like trypsinogen, trypsin, all these enzymes are activated. And that is uh, what is responsible for the destruction, for the digestion, for the inflammation. Agreed? Yes. So don't you think that people who have these inherited disorders, inheritance in the family, there also something to do with these enzymes must have gone problematic. So what is it? Uh, normally, uh, normally, do you want trypsin to eat up your own pancreas? Normally, do you want trypsin to break your own pancreas? Obviously not. You don't want that. So you keep a control over trypsin. You keep a control over trypsin. Or do you want uh, that uh, more of trypsinogen should change to trypsin and you should ultimately land up with uh, destruction? No, you don't want all of that. So who are the people who are keeping all this under control? The PRSS1 gene and the SPINK1 gene. They are making sure that trypsin does not kill you. But now, please remember, PRSS1 gene gain of function mutation and SPINK1 gene loss of function mutation, please remember, they are responsible for your uh, pancreatitis. PRSS1 with P, SPINK1, remember these two are important, out of which PRSS1 gene results in autosomal dominant inheritance and SPINK1 results in autosomal recessive inheritance and why am I emphasizing? Because they are also the genes which can, after causing pancreatitis, predispose the patient to pancreatic cancer. Robbins clearly mentions that 40% cases with PRSS1 gene can further progress to pancreatic cancer. So please remember the first First and the last alphabet, PRSS1, autosomal dominant, SPINK1, autosomal recessive, both of them can also cause pancreatitis and they can later con cause cancer. Now, what are the others? See, if you are good at learning all the other chromosomes that have been mentioned, the genes that have been mentioned are with C in that table. So, if you are good at learning, go for it. If not, I'll give you a trick. See, it's those names. CFTR, I think cystic fibrosis, everyone knows. This you will never forget. Cystic fibrosis, chromosome 7. This is an all-time favorite. You know this. Next, CAS R. What is CAS? C A for calcium sensing receptor. Simple. Calcium sensing receptor. Okay. CTRC. When I say CTR, C. So it's simple. It is chymotrypsin. Chymo trypsin, chymotrypsin C. And when I say CPA1, carboxypeptidase A1. Carboxypeptidase A1. Is this okay with everyone? So remember CFTR, CASR, CTRC, CPA1. If you forget this, at least you know things like chymotrypsin reminds you of pancreas. Carboxypeptidase reminds you of pancreas. So automatically you will be able to correlate. So these are the less important, but the most important ones that you had were PRSS1 and SPINK1 on which I expect a question with which you have finished this table. See, all the C-related genes, all the C-related genes and the, uh, the two main ones that I was focusing on, PRSS1 and SPINK1. PRSS1, autosomal dominant inheritance, SPINK1, autosomal recessive inheritance. Are we okay with that? That was also the last table that we had for today. So we are done with our discussion guys. Thank you uh, so much for joining in. Uh, let me tell you that um, uh, tomorrow, like I had mentioned, tomorrow we have a session which is going to be on the quiz. So uh, 6 p.m. same time. And in that session, uh, it's a good mixture that we have of uh, questions on neuroblastomas, some questions on hemat, some questions on CNS tumors, some questions on endocrine. So basically a mixture of things that I feel 
and a few previous year questions also have put in them especially from jipmer and prostate cancer which are now the you know the ones which are there in the end i'm going to uh, take a quick image based test also of you uh, you know from you that will be a very quick say uh, you know if you are okay with 5 or even 10 pictures 10 image quiz we can have and that will be a good 1 uh, hour and a little above that session so be prepared for it tomorrow 6 o'clock right and let me tell you that might have some match the following or some questions from these three pdfs also so please please do learn and revise these pdfs because if you now learn these mnemonics these three day mnemonics together and then when you attempt the questions tomorrow you will feel very very confident about your preparation correct tomorrow is our quiz and day after tomorrow all the ini cet aspirants who just got 20 days left and the neat pg aspirants of course for you you had asked me for a last minute revision list so day after tomorrow i'll be coming live i'll also give you the pdf of that list and we'll also discuss uh, in a very short session what you should be doing in these last uh, 20 days for the aims people and for the pg uh, the neat pg students your two month strategy so what are the main main topics of path that you have to focus on that is day after tomorrow that we'll be discussing right um dr manoj you've asked me are these tables sufficient for neat yes definitely that is the whole concept behind it they are not only sufficient they are very important for neat um pdf of this uh, is available on uh, my own telegram channel it is available on the an academy telegram channel so whatever group you are part of you can download it from there right okay so um Thank you so much all for uh, joining in and see you all tomorrow sharp at 6 pm have a nice